Jesus was a rock star. It's always the same. I always oh, tell them. Do they listen to me? Hi. Oh, no. Is this a little bunny runaway? Well, howdy. I am Pastor Scott Cruz, and we are doing a ser- uh, series right now for Rock Church called Been There. Jesus has experienced all kinds of things that we experience. He had the entire human uh, experience. He was the God man. He was 100% man and 100% God at the same time. So he knows what you're going through. He knows what I'm going through. And today we're talking about temptation. And that little video we just had, just kind of playing with that a little bit because uh, those cute little bunnies, they turn out to be some pretty bad temptations sometimes. And Jesus was tempted. And today is when the urge is too strong. When the urge is too strong. And so maybe uh, you're out there and you weren't going to buy it, but you did. You weren't going to drink it, but you did. You ate the whole thing. You clicked it. You snorted it. You smoked it. You did whatever it was uh, that you were not wanting to do and gave in to temptation. And I think we've all been there. We've all done that. I certainly have. And Jesus didn't give in to temptation, but he definitely knew uh, what it what it felt like. And it, we, we find this out in Matthew chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Uh, forty days and forty nights he fasted and he became hungry. So Jesus was very hungry. The devil comes up to him and says, Hey, Jesus, all you got to do is make these stones bread. And if you're a son of God, you know, go ahead and tell these loaves to become bread. And of course, Jesus doesn't do it. <clears throat> Satan goes through a, a few other temptations with Jesus. We're not going to take time for that right now. But he uses the word of God against the enemy and thwarts the enemies, um, what he's trying to do. And so here's a definition of temptation for you. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of your obedience to God. And so when, when you're tempted, the enemy is trying to destroy you and kill you and, and drag you kicking and screaming to hell. And there's a process to temptation. There's nothing new about this. All temptation starts with a thought. It, it's a thought that comes. It might be, you know, you're scrolling on Facebook and, and you, you see something there. Then, and it's just, it's just a quick thought to begin with. But then there has to take another step because, you know, it isn't sin to be tempted. And so we, we have that thought. But what do we do with that thought? Do we kind of dwell on that thought and begin to imagine? So you start playing with that thought a little bit. And then as you're playing with that thought, then there becomes a justification that comes to your mind. It kind of tells you, well, it's really not that bad. You can do it because of these reasons. Uh, you know, uh, your, your wife's not paying attention to you anymore. Your husband is neglecting you. Oh, you wish you had this. You wish you had that. And then finally comes the choice. Um, So three truths about temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted. And you're the most vulnerable to temptation when you're weak and you think that you're strong. That's when you're the most vulnerable to temptation. And number three, uh, you got to know that God will always give you a way out. It's not a sin to be tempted. Hebrews 5, 4, uh, 15, it says, This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings that we do, yet did not sin. So Jesus knows exactly what we're being tempted, so it's not it's not a sin to be tempted. Um, now, sadly, you're more likely to be tempted if you're not a threat to the devil. So I just want to encourage you that if you are trying to do things for Jesus. He's going to come with whatever temptations he possibly can. And the enemy is going to try to trip you up. And so uh, becoming a Christian, it doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. As a matter of fact, the better Christian you are, the more vested interest the enemy has to come and trip you up. James chapter 1, verse 13 and 15, it says, And remember that when you're be- being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. 
God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And so now I don't know where one lifts up and the other no, and the other one starts. I know that temptation, it comes from my own fleshy nature, and it also comes from the enemy trying to trip me up. They work together. Uh, but boy, I don't even know if I need the devil's help that much uh, to be tempted. I, it's, um, it, it's, it's tough. Uh, God, uh, uh, when God tests you, he's wanting to promote you. When the devil tempts you, he's trying to pull you back. And so if it comes from God's hand, it's good. And we just got to push into it. Number two, you are most vulnerable to temptation when you're weak and you think that you're strong. That's when you are in trouble with temptation. Uh, When you're tired, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're hurting, um, Jesus he was weak when, when Satan was tempting him. He'd been fasting for a long time. He was hungry. He wanted to turn those stones into bread. Um, but that is when we are the most tempted is when we think that we're so strong. We think we're strong. And so I hope to, I hope to obliterate, uh, obliterate that in you today. And so that's, that's the goal of today that, that we're trying to do. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, If you think you are standing strong, be careful and do not fall. Uh, do not fall. First Peter 5, 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. If you know he's coming, shut the door that he is like, that you are, that he's likely to come into. And so I'm going to try to encourage you today to, um, I'm going to show you how you can avoid temptation. Because it's how the enemy is going to try and kill and destroy you. Temptation often comes through a door that is left open. And you leave that door open because you didn't think you had to close it. And so, and so I'm going to give you the secret. This is the secret to resisting temptation. I'm giving it to you right now. It's super important. If you do what I'm about to tell you, you will resist temptation better than David did. You're going to resist temptation better than Peter did. Going to resist it better than Samson did. All right. Temptation comes with door left open. And so the way you resist temptation is not to be tempted. That's how you resist temptation is don't be tempted because you are not as strong as you think you are. You're not Jesus. Maybe Jesus can say, just look straight on at Jesus. But I'm here to tell you today, the best way for you to resist temptation is not to be tempted tempted. Don't do as the wicked do, it tells us in Proverbs, and don't follow the path of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Remember, that thought comes in your mind, and that thought becomes an imagination. That's where you begin to fight the temptation. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away and keep on moving. If you're trying to stay away from uh, drinking and alcohol and those kinds of things, maybe you shouldn't have your Bible study in a bar. Just a thought. Just a thought. Maybe if you are if you're battling lust in your life and may, and you go to that gym and and they they just dress a certain way and you can't handle it, maybe you exercise at home. Okay. Maybe if you're at work. And that girl comes up and she kind of brushes up against you and you get that feeling. And you guys know what that feeling is. It's, ooh. <laughs> and you get that. I'm telling you, don't play footsie with that. Don't follow around with that. Run away. Transfer. Quit. Get out. Get out. Go, go, go. Be- and there's two kinds of sorries in this world. One is a worldly sorrow. And one is a godly sorrow. Well, a worldly sorrow is defensive and argumentative. In other words, that girl comes up and, and your hands, they just kind of brush a little bit. And you get that, whoo 
cool feeling. And, and, but then you defend it. It's not that big of a deal. I'm just playing around. Or maybe um, you start inter- uh, has, trading some messages and you get caught and you're sorry you get caught and you become come up with excuses. If you've had that experience, it's easier to see it in somebody else. It's easier to see it in somebody else. They get caught doing something and they just come with excuses. Maybe your kid is good at that. I know a kid that is, can do that sometimes. And, and they somehow make it my fault that they did something. Um, that is a worldly sorrow that defends and justifies. It minimizes the pain. It minimizes the hurt. Um, a godly sorrow is marked by a genuine humility. Um, Not that you were caught, but because of the pain that was caused. That's a godly, godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, For the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience, God wants you to experience sorrow over your sin. Sorrow over your sin. It leads us away from sin, and it results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow. In other words, that sorrow comes in and you just wrap your arms around it because you know you hurt God. You know you hurt your wife. You know you hurt your children. You know that you hurt everybody that you care about. But a worldly sorrow lacks repentance and it results in spiritual death in spiritual death, get that godly sorrow. So the best way, the best way for you to resist temptation is this. Run, you fools. Run, you fools. Don't even mess around with it. Run. Man, get out of that sin. In Timothy 2.2.2, it says flee evil desires of, uh, of run away, run away. Run away. Matthew 6, 13, it tells us and lead us not into temptation. Isn't that something? How in the scripture, it doesn't say, oh, make us so strong in the midst of temptation. No, Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Lord, deliver us from evil. Because if I'm left to my own devices, if I'm in certain situations, I will do certain things. Run away. Run away. Run away. <laughs> Genesis 39, 12, we find a story where, where uh, somebody takes this uh, very seriously. Now, there's a couple of people in the Bible who irritate me. Daniel is one. Uh, Joseph is another one. Um, and, and what I, but I, I can identify a little bit with Joseph um, in that the ladies find me really, no, that's not how I can identify with Joseph. Um, I can identify with him because um, the Lord taught me a lesson like this early in my Christian walk. Um, and I'm very grateful for it. But what happens with Joseph is he is, of course, he's sold into slavery by his brothers. That's a terrible thing. And while he's a slave, he's promoted, promoted, promoted until he is running the whole household for the person who had purchased him. And so he's running this household. However, uh, Joseph, you know, like yours truly, uh, was a good looking man. He was a, very, a good looking man. And, and, and so the boss's wife started checking him out. Boss's wife started checking, checking him out. And, uh, and she comes on to him and says, oh, no, uh, um, I, I don't want to because of the trust that your husband has put in me. I, I just don't want to do anything to hurt that relationship. And she's, oh, no. And then one day, she's pushing him, she's pushing him. And in verse 12, the scripture says she came and she grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in his, her hand and ran from the house. And from the house, um, he ran away, literally, just like the scripture says. And I could afford uh, to be uh, to be a little more like uh, Joseph in that. When I was um, I was newly, I was, I was a fairly new Christian at a Bible study in my basement, and um, and I had. Uh, and I got a girlfriend. Now, just so you know, my wife is amazing, and I love her so much, and she loves it when I talk about old girlfriends. But it illustrates the, the point too well. 
um, for me not to, to mention this to you. Now, just so you know, uh, my wife and I were, were both virgins when we got married. Uh, that is a foundation to build your marriage on that just cannot be replaced. And, and I encourage you to, to do the same. Um, so, so, you know, I didn't do that, okay? Um, but I was in the seventh grade. And, and I could, just couldn't keep my hands off this girl. She'd come over and we'd make out, you know. And, and, and I remember then I would have Bible study. One time she, it happened right before Bible study. She came over, we made out, and I'm, and I'm trying to teach Bible study. And I just felt like the biggest loser that ever, that ever lived. And I learned something about myself through that experience. If you put me in certain situations, I will do certain things. And, and so early on, I decided that I suck at temptation. I decided that, you know, um, if, if I am in this situation and I'm going to do certain things. And so the only answer is for me not to get into that situation. And then there was a fear of God that came. I, I find it kind of disturbing that I was as weak as I was. And God planted that in me. And I'm so grateful now because I, I have a, a strong fear of God. Now, you may think, oh, Scott, you wimp, you wimp. But I just want to encourage you, um, just like Sir Robin. He fucked all. Yes, be Sir Robin. Be Sir Robin. Coming back to James again. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. The devil doesn't even have to help me get into trouble because those desires, they live inside of me. And they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after these desires are conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Now, I started out with a very silly video today about a little bunny that tears people's heads off. And you could judge me if you want for playing that whole thing because it's kind of awesome. But these cute little sins that glance across the way uh, in the gym, that, um, you know, click in the friend button to request a friendship with an old girlfriend that moment when you're flipping through the channels and, and something flashes on the screen that, 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 that grabs a hold of you, whatever it might be, I want to encourage you that it, it, it looks so innocent, little, and cute. But sin will destroy you. And if you have flirted with the devil some and you've got things in your life right now that you know are not pleasing to God, I want to remind you about godly sorrow that we talked about a little bit ago. If you have never wept for your sin, I think you have some repenting to do because you thought your sin was cuter than it really is. If you somehow, some way have been coming to church and you've got, you've got cute sins in your life, but you could, you could tell your friends about it and they'd be like, well, everybody does that. If you want to be a lover of Jesus, I implore you with all of my heart to endeavor to live in purity, strength, and righteousness. And that's what God wants for you because after the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, it looks so cute for so long. But as it grows, it will destroy everything that you care about. It will destroy everything that you care about. So be Sir Robin. I don't know what it is in your life. I don't know if it's when you get around certain people, you do certain things. You've got certain temptations. Maybe you've gone down that road before. Maybe you're in a situation where you've stolen something and you had lots of good reasons why that was the right thing to do. And you pr maybe you, there was a, a sin and you thought, and you prayed about it. And then you had peace about it in your heart that, that that sin was okay for you to do, that you didn't have to deal with that right now. Can I tell you, I love you. I'm going to tell you the truth. That's a lie from Satan. It's a lie from Satan. 
And I encourage you to cry out to God right now and say, Lord, would you please provide the proper sorrow for my sin? How it hurts the heart of God. How it hurts and destroys your kids. How it hurts and destroys your relationships. That it makes your Jesus weak, weep when you push away his love, his forgiveness, the death on the cross, and you show that as trite and common and you shove it away because somehow something has convinced you that your sin is not that bad. So two things I want to encourage you to do today. One is don't let that cute little sin go. Don't let that little thing begin to grow and take root in your heart because you will harden your heart and that causes all kinds of other problems. You'll become a spoiled brat, old fart Christian the moment that you start winking at your sin, thinking that you're something. And also, um, it, it'll, it'll destroy. It'll destroy your happiness. It'll destroy your life. It'll destroy your family. So I'm going to pray. And as I do, I want to encourage you to pray with me. And I'm going to, I'm going to give the Lord my life and I'm going to lay my heart in front of him. And I want you to do the same that we can know him and love him forever in purity because the Lord is coming for a, for a, a white bride, for a pure bride. And you know, you may say, well, Scott, I've already done all of these things. (laughs) <laughs> you know what the good news is? That's grace, man. That's the moment that you get to experience the grace and the goodness of God. So even if uh, you have done the deed, you can be completely made clean today. A new line in the sand. So allow that sorrow to come to overwhelm you. Embrace that sorrow. But then you lay that sin at his feet and you walk in his grace. And you know that you can forgive yourself because Jesus has forgiven you. You have permission to forgive yourself today for those things that you've done. So God, I thank you that you love me even when I have so terribly failed you so many times. Lord, I thank you that you have um, brought me to a place of sorrow. God, I thank you for allowing me to weep over my sin and to be broken And to have that horror grip my heart that says, I don't want to be that guy anymore. I don't ever want to do that thing again. Jesus, heal me and make me new, dear God. I want to know you. I want to love you. And I don't want all this yuck getting in the way of what you have for me, Lord. So Lord, I give you my life. And I repent of my sin, especially the little ones, the little ones that the enemy comes and tells me that this not that big of a deal. Jesus, I don't want anything to become between you and me. And that's by definition, that's what sin does. It, I miss the mark. And I don't want that between us, Lord. So please forgive me, Jesus. Make me like you that I could know and love you forever in purity, in strength, God, in boldness that I could righteously stand up knowing that I'm assured of glad welcome by my father, God, when I approach him, Lord, that Jesus, one day I will get to look in your eyes and see you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into your rest. So God, to rejoice in that today. And Lord, I pray that every person that is praying with me now, that, you, that they would experience, that we, that I would experience the proper sorrow, oh God, to get on the other side of grace to walk through the yuck, to repent of my sin in a wholehearted way that I would never have to fight that same battle again. God, that that you would bring me closer and closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. May the richly bless you. Thank you so much for spending this time with me here. And know that there is grace for whatever you've done. But it's pretty important that I, uh, I have sorrow over my sin. It's not cute. It's not cuddly. It keeps me from the Lord. And so I don't want it in my life. Jesus was a rock star.